Hello, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Welcome to this technical briefing on the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. Bienvenue à cette séance d'information technique sur le déploiement des vaccins contre la COVID-19. As usual, a question and answer session will follow shortly. Une période de questions et réponses suivra sous peu. Mais pour le moment, je cède la parole au Dr. Howard New. Dr. New, over to you. Okay, thank you. Merci. Good morning, and thank you for joining us at this technical briefing on the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in Canada. I'm here with Major General Denis Fortin, Vice President of Operations and Logistics at the Public Health Agency of Canada. We will each provide brief opening remarks and then open the floor to questions. To assist us in answering your questions, we also have with us Ms. Ariane Reza, the Assistant Deputy Minister on Public Services and Procurement Canada. Deliveries of COVID-19 vaccines to Canada have been ramping up this week, and we can expect these to increase in the weeks to come. As of today, more than 1,329,036 doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Canada. As of last Saturday, 2.7% of Canadians had received at least one dose of vaccine, and 0.8% had received two doses. The number of vaccine doses administered in the second week of February is back to what it was in mid-January, after two weeks of reduced vaccination. The territories have also administered vaccines to 32.9% of its adult population, which means they are getting closer to their goal of vaccinating 75% of adults in the first quarter of this year. In anticipation of supply increases and to prepare for the next stages of Canada's vaccine rollout, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has updated its guidance on prioritization of populations for vaccine sequencing. The rationale for this guidance is clear. Protecting large groups of individuals who are at a higher risk helps protect all people in Canada by reducing hospitalizations and deaths. To illustrate, among those populations NACI identifies as priority populations for the next stages of immunization are individuals in congregate living and work settings. These individuals are at higher risk of contracting COVID-19 because they may not be able to maintain physical distance, isolate, or consistently practice other important public health measures like washing their hands frequently. Adults in indigenous communities where infection can have disproportionate consequences are also among the priority populations identified in NACI's updated guidance. We know that these individuals encounter many barriers in accessing healthcare services, including culture and language. By vaccinating them quickly, we can help protect the vulnerable in their communities. As has been the case since Canada authorized its first COVID-19 vaccine, NACI's guidance will continue to inform federal, provincial, and territorial vaccination programs. Throughout this past year, Canadians have come together to protect those most at risk. It is important that we continue to prioritize them in order to minimize serious illness and deaths due to COVID-19. Even with our increase in COVID-19 vaccine supply in Canada, we must remain steadfast in following public health measures and the COVID-19 guidance of local public health authorities. Bonjour. Merci de vous joindre à cette séance d'information technique. Good morning. Le Thank you for joining us at this technical briefing on the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in Canada. I am here with Major General Denis Fortin, Vice President of Operations and Logistics at the Public Health Agency of Canada. We will each provide brief opening remarks and then open the floor to questions. <clears throat> to assist us in answering your questions, we also have with us Ariane Reza, Assistant, Public, Assistant Deputy Minister for Public Services and Procurement Canada. Deliveries of COVID-19 vaccines to Canada have been ramping up this week, and we can expect these to increase in the weeks to come. As of today, more than 1,329,036 doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Canada. As of last Saturday, 2.7% of Canadians had received at least one dose of vaccine and 0.8% had received two doses. The number of vaccine doses administered in the second week of February is back to what it was in mid-January after two weeks of reduced vaccination. The territories have also administered vaccines to 32.9% of their adult population, which means they are getting closer to their goal of vaccinating 
75% of adults in the first quarter of this year. In anticipation of supply increases and to prepare for the next stages of Canada's vaccine rollout, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has updated its guidance on prioritization of populations for vaccine sequencing. The rationale for this guidance is clear. Protecting large groups of individuals who are at a higher risk helps protect all people in Canada by reducing hospitalizations and deaths. To illustrate, among those populations NASI identifies as priority populations for the next stages of immunization are individuals in congregate living and work settings. These individuals are at high risk of contracting COVID-19 because they may not be able to maintain physical distance, isolate, or consistently maintain other public important public health measures like washing their hands frequently. Adults in Indigenous communities where infection can have disproportionate consequences are also among the priority populations identified in NASA's, NASI's updated guidance. We know that these individuals encounter many barriers in accessing health care services, including culture and language. By vaccinating them quickly, we can help protect the vulnerable in their communities. As has been the case since Canada authorized its first COVID-19 vaccine, NASI's guidance will continue to inform federal, provincial and territorial vaccination programs. Throughout this past year, Canadians have come together to protect those most at risk. It is important that we continue to prioritize them in order to minimize serious illness and death due to COVID-19. Even with increasing COVID-19 vaccine supply in Canada, we must remain steadfast in following public health measures and the COVID-19 guidance of local public health authorities. I will now ask Major General Fortin to say a few words. Thank you. Hello, bonjour. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to date, we have distributed a cumulative of 1.5 million doses of both uh, authorized vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, across the country. This week, we received 403,650 doses of Pfizer-BioNTech, and the arrival in Canada was slightly delayed due to weather on the East Coast. All doses are now in-country, and distribution to provinces is now underway and will be completed by the end of this week. Next week, we are expecting to receive 475,000 doses. By the end of this month, we will have delivered approximately 1.8 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech to provinces. The manufacturer has confirmed delivery schedule until the end of this quarter. As of now, we anticipate receiving 444,000 doses each week in March. By the end of March, we will have distributed 4 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech product. Last week, Minister Anan announced that the government of Canada negotiated an accelerated delivery schedule for Pfizer-BioNTech. This means that doses of Pfizer-BioNTech scheduled for delivery in the summer will now be delivered earlier. During the spring, we expect to receive an additional 2.8 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech on what was previously, previously anticipated. As for Moderna, we have distributed over half a million doses across the country since December. The next shipment is expected to arrive next week and will consist of 168,000 doses. The remaining 1.3 million Moderna doses to round out their uh, Q1, the first quarter commitment of 2 million doses, are expected in March over two shipments. We are working with the manufacturer to confirm the exact doses, uh, quantities, and uh, dates are still to come. Uh, the territories will receive their first quarter allocation over the next two Moderna shipments. Contending with a number of constraints, this acceleration in deliveries to the north 
will allow the territories to enable the vaccination of 75% of their adult population in the first three months of 2021. The decision was made in consultation with other federal partners, as well as provinces and territories, and is based on communities' limited access to robust healthcare services imposed by their remote and isolated locations. Now, rest assured that at the end of Q1, all provinces and territories will receive their allocation just as they uh, were communicated to them previously. Government of Canada has also purchased an additional 4 million doses of, of the Moderna vaccine, bringing the total number of secured doses to 44 million. The additional 4 million doses are expected to arrive uh, between July and September. Now, in preparation for this large scale ramp up, the Vaccine National Operations Center continues to work closely with provinces and territories and stakeholders to ensure that they have the capacity and capability to keep pace with the increasing uh, shipment size of authorized COVID-19 vaccines. Moving ahead, we're expecting to receive 23 million doses from Pfizer and Moderna between April and June. And this is now what our planning is focusing on. So we remain in discussions every day with all our partners to ensure that we're all in sync and have the latest updates for uh, all stakeholders. Alors, bonjour, bon matin. Uh, à ce jour, nous avons distribué un total de 1.5 million de doses. Good morning. Des deux produits autorisés. To date, we Pfizer have distributed a cumulative 1.5 million doses uh, of both Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna vaccines to provinces and territories. Uh, this week, Canada received 403,650 doses of Pfizer-BioNTech, and distribution, uh, of course, was delayed by the weather in the East, on the East Coast. But uh, the delivery should be complete by the end of this week. Next week, we are expecting to receive around 475,000 doses. By the end of February, we will have delivered approximately 1.8 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech to provinces. The manufacturer has confirmed delivery schedule until the end of the first quarter. As of now, we anticipate receiving 444,000 doses weekly in March. By the end of March, we will have distributed 4 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech. <clears throat> Last week, Minister Anand announced that the Government of Canada negotiated an accelerated delivery schedule for Pfizer-BioNTech. This means that doses of Pfizer-BioNTech scheduled for delivery in the summer will now be delivered earlier. During the spring, we expect to receive an additional 2.8 million doses of Pfizer-BioNTech on top of what was previously anticipated. As for Moderna, we have distributed over half a million doses across the country since December. The next shipment is expected to arrive next week and will consist of 168,000 doses. Moderna, the remaining 1.3 million Moderna doses to rent out their first quarter commitment of 2 million doses are expected in March over two shipments. We're working with the manufacturer to confirm the exact doses and dates to come. The territories will receive their first quarter allocation of the next two Moderna shipments. This acceleration in deliveries to the north will, north will allow the territories to enable the vaccination of 75% of their adult populations in the first three months of 2021. This decision was made in consultation with other partners at the federal level as well as provinces and territories and is based on communities' limited access to robust healthcare services due to their remote and isolated locations. Rest assured, at the end of the first quarter, all provinces and all territories will have received their allocations just as had been communicated to them previously. The government of Canada, the government of Canada has also purchased an additional 4 million doses of the Moderna vaccine, bringing the total number of secured doses to 44 million. The additional 4 million doses are expected to arrive between July and September. In preparation for this larger scale ramp up, the Vaccine National Operations Centre continues to work closely with the provinces and territories and other stakeholders to ensure they have the capacity and capability to keep pace with the increasing shipment size of authorized COVID-19 vaccines. Moving ahead, 
We are expecting to receive 23 million doses from Pfizer and Moderna between April and June. And we're focusing on that at this point. We are focusing our planning efforts on that. Every day, we remain in discussions with all of our partners to ensure we are all in sync and have all the latest updates. With that, I am prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Merci, Major General. So we'll now take questions. As usual, we ask that you please limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up. Vous pouvez poser vos questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Une question principale est... You may ask the questions in the language of your choice. One, follow one question, one follow-up. Operator? Thank you. Merci. Vice President, star one, if you have a question, but you have to use the one for all questions. Our first question is from Mackenzie Gray from CTV. Please go ahead, Abu uh, Hi there. My first question is for uh, Major General Fortin. In the chart that PHAC distributed, it listed a potential uh, number of Canadians who could be vaccinated based on all of the deliveries of the vaccines that Canada has procured. Can you tell us, uh, for a particular, the Q2 number, the 24.5 million, what vaccines are uh, calculated into getting that number? So the uh, the chart that was provided it shows over time uh, the expected the cumulative number of Canadians vaccinated. Uh, the top the top row would indicate the number of Canadians vaccinated with the currently approved vaccines Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, and Moderna. Um, the second uh, the second line um, would uh, suggest that additional vaccines, as they become approved and available. Uh, consistent with our uh, procurement uh, arrangements. Um, they will be brought uh, on charge and will be distributed and uh, will be uh, made accessible to Canadians. So those are planning figures, an up to number, if you will. Uh, and that's uh, that's a uh, the, the high level that we're planning against uh, with provinces and territories. Uh, I get that, but I'm just looking to know which vaccines you've used in that calculation. So is it AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson? Is Novavax included in there? Is Medicago used? just want to know what vaccines you're, you're using to get that Q2 number. So perhaps if you permit, this is Ariane Reza from PSPC. I could um, answer that question. So as you know, we have uh, seven APAs that are signed for the the Q2 numbers, it includes, based on pending regulatory approval, five of the seven. Medicago and Sanofi would not be coming along online as early as Q2. So the five that are included in that row, as it relates to um, the ones that we have with regulatory approval in place, Moderna and Pfizer, and three more that are under regulatory review, which are AZ, Johnson & Johnson, and Novavax. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Charlie Pinkenturn from iPolitics. Please go ahead. I parole. Good morning, all. Thanks, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, the New England Medical Journal published a letter yesterday from a pair of Canadian scientists explaining that based on the data that was submitted to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, um, that Pfizer's vaccine showed an efficacy of just under 93% after just a single dose. Um, two weeks after that first dose was given, um, the authors of that letter suggest that insisting that people receive two doses uh, one month apart actually adds little benefit, and that given the current vaccine shortage, that uh, giving single doses should be the priority. Um, what I'm wondering is if uh, Health Canada and our plan is sort of set on the two-dose regimen, or if there's any deliberation or study um, by Health Canada, PHAC, um, into potentially moving to a single-dose system for this vaccine to speed up the, the, the overall rollout. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's a Dr. New, so I, I'll think I'll take that one. Uh, yeah, certainly the two authors uh, on the New England Journal uh, are, are good colleagues of ours, and they've actually uh, presented to our special advisory committee uh, as well. Uh, these are what I would call early data in terms of vaccine effectiveness uh, or, uh, studies. 
And um, uh, the indications uh, are that uh, there is a good level of protection after uh, uh, just one dose. And this is a, a, a certain period of time after receiving that first dose. So uh, certainly as we uh, unroll our, our vaccine uh, vaccines across the country, but also looking at the experience of other countries, uh, uh, more and more evidence is being accumulated uh, with respect to vaccine effectiveness, uh, uh, be it after one dose and, uh, or, or two doses. And so uh, all that information is being uh, looked at very carefully, uh, being analyzed by our, our experts, uh, as well in the National Advisory Committee of Immunization. And those deliberations and, and discussions are, are, are very live and, and ongoing right now. Thank you. Thank you, follow up. So um, just to sort of follow up on that, um, it, it sounds like there, <laughs> there's some sort of consideration behind the scenes that, that this could be an option. Please correct me if, if I'm wrong in interpreting that. Um, this seems like it would be uh, more difficult, you know, moving from a two-dose regimen to a single-dose regimen than doing something like we've seen with the syringes, um, simply because of the nature of, of study involved. Um, can you talk a bit more about, you know, what, what exactly the work is that that needs to be done by Health Canada specifically to approve something like this? Again, assuming that I am interpreting what you said correctly. Okay, Dr. You know, I can't speak uh, from a regulatory perspective. You know, the official monograph uh, uh, from the manufacturer is uh, for, uh, for, for two doses uh, based on their clinical data, their clinical trial uh, uh, trials that uh, were conducted and, and saying that there's a certain uh, uh, efficacy uh, based on their clinical trial data uh, for a certain interval, you know, 21 days or 28 days, depending if you're talking about the Pfizer, uh, BioNTech, or the Moderna vaccines. Uh, however, as we're now rolling out the vaccine, sort of as you say, in the real world, uh, more and more uh, evidence and uh, experience uh, is being accumulated, and uh, it is something that is uh, being discussed more from a uh, implementation uh, uh, perspective, but also uh, uh, in terms of, uh, I, I would say. Uh, uh, what is the balance uh, between uh, uh, protecting a larger number of people uh, with the one dose uh, as opposed to uh, maybe a smaller number uh, with two doses? And, uh, and the questions raised by the authors, I think, are legitimate, legitimate ones. Uh, uh, would uh, sort of uh, two doses and the incremental, let's say, uh, whatever the difference is, the delta between uh, uh, the level of protection after one dose uh, or two doses, uh, is that offset by maybe a vaccinating a larger uh, number of uh, Canadians with just the one dose. And then, of course, uh, once uh, the vaccine supply uh, becomes much more plentiful, uh, being able to uh, uh, to then offer, I guess, uh, the, the full two-dose re regime to all Canadians. So so those the discussions are ongoing, and we continue to monitor uh, uh, the sort of the results of vaccination uh, as, uh, as it's uh, unfolding across the country in terms of vaccine effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Our next question is from Raymond Fignon de TVA. À vous la parole. Please go ahead. Merci. Question pour le Major General Fortin. Major General, qu'est-ce que question vous avez comme Major General que Moderna, Fortin? What assurances have you received as to Moderna's inaudible? Oui. Alors, uh, answer. Moderna nous assure. Listen. Moderna has assured us that the production will increase considerably over the coming weeks. They have assured us that they are in a position to meet their objectives of 2 million by the end of March, which clearly indicates that uh, a major hike is required to reach that 1.3 uh, million in March. We are in constant conversation with them and we're already, they're already in a position to tell us that we'll be able to go from a three-week to a two-week delivery schedule. Bien, although we don't yet have the exact figures of what we'll receive by, by mid-March, uh, the trend is, uh, is higher. It's, it's, we're trending higher for the month of March. What we're hearing from Moderna, uh, we have confidence in, and I feel I will be in a position to confirm the quantities by mid-March. Follow-up question for Dr. New, the Toronto Public Health Director said she's never been as concerned as she is today by the threat of the virus due to the variants. Do you share this concern? To what extent are you concerned? 
Answer. I think all public health uh, authorities throughout the country, including myself and Dr. Tam, yes, we are all, how can I put it, concerned by these variants. We know what's happening in other countries, for instance, in the UK. We know that the variants that have already been identified are more easily spread. Uh, of course, there may not be uh, that much evidence as to how, how much more serious the actual uh, disease can be. But it's possible, and it is up to us to follow up on what is going on with variants throughout the country. We have to redouble our efforts with our public health measures that, that have been successful, even in the UK. When you look at the community spread of the variants, when they imposed public health measures that were how can I put it? Uh, there were also practiced with the lockdown measures, etc. It is possible to stall or at least limit the spread of the variants. This is something we're looking very closely at here in Canada and following closely. At the same time, we are moving ahead with the vaccination effort. There's still many Canadians who are vulnerable to COVID-19, and we really need to continue along with good public health measures population-wide and also uh, as individuals. Thank you. Our next question is from Mia Robson from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Hi, yes. Um, I'm wondering, uh, maybe Dr. New, you could uh, um, talk a little bit more about what evidence Canada has about the impact vaccines have had so far. We've seen some evidence that maybe long-term care outbreaks in Quebec have, uh, have gone down. Um, how are we collecting that evidence? And what evidence do we have, if any, that uh, vaccines have had an impact on the spread in Canada so far? Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, what I, I just, I think I mentioned earlier with uh, uh, some of the, the, the two authors who uh, penned a New England Journal uh, of Medicine, a sort of a, uh, opinion piece. Um, we've had uh, good presentations because obviously in each of the provinces and territories, uh, uh, they're monitoring very closely uh, uh, what's happening with their vaccination efforts and also looking at what we call vaccine effectiveness. Uh, uh, as it's being rolled out in, in settings such as long-term care facilities. And uh, we've had presentations, uh, they've done their preliminary analysis uh, of the data and the results are encouraging, uh, uh, showing that there is a, a good increase in, in, in terms of the level of protection uh, uh, for residents in these types of settings, uh, even after one dose, uh, as was uh, alluded to uh, earlier. However, I would say that uh, at the national level, we've received uh, uh, these presentations, but I would certainly leave it to the, uh, I think the the experts and and the authorities at the at the provincial level to, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, bring forward into the I would say the public domain the results of their uh, specific uh, studies that they've been uh, uh, undertaking in their own jurisdictions. Thank you. Thanks, and I think this is probably for Major General Fortin. Um, I'd like you to maybe go through the numbers that we're expecting in the spring again. I think you said 23 million doses now. Um, and I'm wondering, when it comes to Pfizer, how much of that increase is because of the six doses? Are we getting the same number of vials as we were supposed to get, but because of six doses, that's why they're saying we're getting more? Or are we actually getting more vials in the spring than we were expecting? Yes, so we're getting more vaccine uh, than initially uh, anticipated in in uh, the second quarter in the spring. Brought from uh, summer, the summer, uh, the quarter that we're expecting is summer. Uh, some of that is brought forward, and uh, all the vaccines that we were planning on receiving in the fall and are brought into the summer. So by September, we will have received 40 million doses of Pfizer uh, product. Um, so the so the six doses versus five is uh, part of the calculus, uh, but also additional vials 
uh, of vaccines to make up for uh, this uh, this uh, considerable increase. But the 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 takeaway here is that combined, we'll have twenty you know around twenty three million vaccines in the spring. So um, you can see that we're now coming out of this uh, period of uh, limited supplies into an abundance of supplies spring and summer. Uh, where we can have uh, a significant scale up, uh, scaling up of uh, immunization plans in provinces, and uh, and uh, and that and that will um, that will be the focus. That is the focus of our planning efforts right now, closely coordinating with provinces and territories. Thank you, follow up. Oh, I see. No, next question. Thank you. Our next question is from Kate Bolongaro from Bloomberg. Please go ahead. I would have parole. Hello. This question is about the different estimates for quarter two. I'm wondering what are the comparison of the estimates that were released today versus the estimates that were given in January and how the difference is the cost? Thank you. Well, it's General Fortin here. I I did not completely get the question. This was caught off uh, comparison with January, but I'm not sure what the question was. It was a question about Q2 and how if, how what are the differences between the numbers? It's it's Doctor New here. Um, we're having trouble uh, hearing and understanding you. There's a lot of uh, echoed feedback uh, on your mic. Is it maybe possible? Uh, I don't know if you're using hands free or, or using uh, maybe getting closer to the mic so we can maybe better hear you. Can you hear me better now? There's still some echo. If you speak slowly, we'll probably be able to hear you. Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering what is the comparison between the two numbers published today versus the ones that were published in January, for example. What are the differences in the numbers and what are those due to? Okay, it's General Fortin. I think I think if I understood the question right, what is the difference between the Q2 numbers that I'm now sharing, that we've been sharing uh, lately, and what was initially published back in December, January? Uh, I think there's a there's a couple of different things. First, uh, data um, or quantities are confirmed uh, by uh, Pfizer and uh, Pfizer and uh, Moderna as we move forward. Um, Pfizer is coming out of the retooling of their uh, production line, and we see the results in numbers. The second, uh, the second part of this, of course, as uh, as discussed uh, in the last couple of uh, press conferences, uh, we're moving to a six dose calculus as opposed to five doses per vial. So that also sees an increase in uh, numbers. So specific to your point about uh, what we may have, what we published in January, uh, this was with uh, five doses per vial for Pfizer. Uh, and once the regulatory approval, a regulatory change uh, was uh, in effect, uh, the week of 15 February, uh, fe February 15, uh, we now calculate with six doses per vial, and that was reflected uh, on what is now available on Canada.ca uh, webpage. Thank you. So, so yeah, may I, go may ahead. I add, it's Ariana Reza from PSTC. If I could just add a follow on to that, uh, just in terms of the net change between what we shared in December and now. I think we are up about 5.1 million doses expected in Q2 through uh, negotiations with Moderna and Pfizer and some of the uh, announcements from uh, the Prime Minister and Minister Anand. Thank you. Thank you. And for your follow-up, again, if you could just speak slowly and, and maybe just mute the feed, which, is, which seems to be in the background and cause some kind of echo. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. So next question, prochaine question. Thank you. Our next question is from Tonda McCharles from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead, I la parole. Good morning. Um, I'm not sure if you touched on this yet, but it's been a very great topic for um, statement. But uh, 
I wonder if you could speak to um, what the situation is with AstraZeneca. Um, not just the timeline for approval, but speaking of, you know, the real world data that you're looking at, are, is Health Canada waiting on more real world data uh, and how AstraZeneca is playing out in other jurisdictions now before it makes its decision on approval? Hi, Tanda. It's uh, it's uh, Dr. New here. Um, uh, I think I heard your question. It has to do with sort of the regulatory approval for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, as, uh, like I said, uh, our, our Health Canada colleagues, uh, the regulated regulators, are still in in the I think uh, in the process of doing their due diligence. Uh, I understand that they're continuing to receive information and data from the AstraZeneca uh, that uh, would be important in terms of their. Uh, uh, analysis uh, uh, as far as your approval process is, is concerned and other than that uh, I really don't have much more for you because obviously it's an independent process and uh, I'm not privy to uh, uh, what uh, what exchanges have taken place and what information data has been uh, given to Health Canada regulators uh, by AstraZeneca. Thank you. Um, in the past you've been able to give us though from Health Canada certainly at least recent been able to give us give us a picture of you know, is the data really the manufacturing side? Is the data is what kind of data you're waiting on? And so I'm, I'm quite unclear as to what it is you're waiting on. Um, but just let me, if I could just move on, but the, if you have any clarification on that, that would be great. If I could just ask from I mean, your general question, on your, on your numbers, um, I think, uh, am I correct in understanding then that the extra doses you get, you, you know, just say getting between April and June, um, is up from the uh, 13 million base you had originally anticipated, or maybe if you could, if you could just enunciate original projection versus the, the most current projection. That would help, I think, some of us understand how you see this being affected. Yeah, um, I'll ask uh, Ms. Reza to complete my answer, but um, what was recently announced is the uh, bringing forward of 2.8 million doses from summer to spring. So that adds to uh, the quantities that we had been working with of 8 million uh, doses of Pfizer alone. Any Anything to add, anyone? Uh, yes, uh, it, it's Ariane Reza from PSTC. Uh, only to know it is very difficult to give a a timeline as the doses keep changing through active negotiation. But I think it's fair to say from what you've seen in December for Q2, we've advanced uh, 5.1 million doses from uh, Q3 and Q4 into Q2. So I'm trying to do the math here for you in terms of the initial amount. It was probably about 18 million doses initially for uh Q2, and now we're closer to uh, 23 million doses. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next question. Prochaine question. Thank you. Our next question is from uh, Evan Dyer from CBC News. Please go ahead. I la parole. Good morning. Uh, this is a question for Dr. New. Um, obviously, uh, older people, more vulnerable people, typically have higher death rates than COVID, and that's the population that you're targeting first with this vaccination campaign. So I guess we would never expect the death rates to decline in a, in a steady way, but rather to see a sharper decline in death rates and hospitalizations at the beginning. I just wonder if you could give us a kind of a picture as you look at the rollout and as you go through the different age bands and vulnerable groups of the population, when do you expect to see um, death rates and hospitalizations decline dramatically? When do you expect to get through those vulnerable populations? Uh, that that produced most of the hospitalizations and deaths from COVID. Well, thank you very much for the question. And uh, as uh, as you know, we've said this uh, at our previous press conferences. Uh, certainly, when you look at hospitalization and uh, and death rates, those are what we call lagging indicators. And uh, uh, let's say before vaccination, uh, we would always say that uh, it is it's usually uh, several weeks afterwards uh, in terms of you know people actually have been been exposed. Uh, and, and getting the virus before we might see, uh, you know, whatever uh, happens to hospitalization and deaths. Uh, uh, in the case now uh, with with uh, with the vaccinations, uh, 
Uh, they're rolling out uh, quite well across the country, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we're starting to get some preliminary uh, uh, data and, and, and the results of vaccine effectiveness uh, uh, from colleagues in the provinces and territories who have uh, uh, start obviously vaccinated, started vaccinating residents in, in, in long-term care facilities. And, uh, and the indications, the early indications are that it's, it's starting to have an, an impact that, uh, that uh, you know, the rates of uh, infection uh, and then obviously uh, uh, subsequently uh, uh, the hospitalization and deaths uh, as a result of sort of COVID-19 exposure and, and, and having a uh, having a disease uh, are, are starting to go down. But I think I, I would wait, uh, certainly as, as time goes on, we'll have, uh, I think, more robust data to be able to present to all of you. Thank you. And um, I know that, that we're talking about a couple of vaccines that have not yet been approved, Novavax and Johnson and & Johnson uh, and so on. But um, how do you see, assuming that they, they are approved and that they become part of the program, how do you see the different vaccines being used in different settings or with different populations. So there are some vaccines, for example, that we should expect to see going to more remote areas or some vaccines that you might hold back for younger, less vulnerable populations. W would there be a sort of a, 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 some vaccines that would be more suitable for some things and what would they be? Yes, a very good question. As I think we mentioned earlier, uh, certainly with the advance or purchase agreements we have for, our, for a, a range of vaccines, uh, and uh, ideally, I think in, in Canada, we would, uh, uh, you know, in, in a few uh, few months or so, have what we call a suite of vaccines, and uh, they would all be part of, I would think, our overall vaccine uh, strategy. Uh, the first two vaccines, uh, uh, as uh, as we've mentioned previously, uh, uh, especially the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, had some uh, logistical challenges, issues, especially uh, with our our geography here and sort of the very uh, sort of a uh, uh, stringent uh, cold chain. Uh, uh, requirements, uh, uh, but you can see that the other vaccines, that, uh, which are you know not yet uh, approved, but uh, uh, if they were to be approved, uh, would be much easier to handle. Uh, you know, more in sort of a, a regular sort of refrigerator temperatures, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, the existing infrastructure that we have to uh, for vaccination, uh, such as for influenza vaccination, could uh, could be brought to bear. So uh, you know, um, through pharmacies and and doctors' offices and so on. I think uh, it would be a much easier to to vaccinate a, a much greater number of Canadians. So those are the kind of uh, factors we're looking at. Uh, one of them is logistical. Uh, the other part also is that uh, we need to look at the profile uh, based on the uh, uh, the clinical uh, data, the trial data that that's been uh, submitted to the regulator. I, I can't speak for the regulator. Um, in terms of what uh, they might actually approve the vaccine use for. Uh, then maybe there might be a, a very specific uh, recommendations in terms of uh, what the vac uh, specific vaccines are approved for. So I, I can't get ahead of that. Uh, the other part though, is that we would also look obviously to our National Advisory Committee on Immunization. The experts who obviously uh, uh, I'll look at uh, the data, the evidence, uh, uh, not just uh, you know uh, based on uh, what the company submits, but also I would think uh, the experience uh, uh, around the world, maybe uh, if the vaccines are already being used in, in other parts of the world. And that would also, uh, I think, inform them in terms of their uh, uh, recommendations that you would put forward in terms of uh, specific uh, vaccines and how they might be best used uh, sort of uh, as part of an overall vaccine strategy. You're right that uh, maybe for certain vaccines, uh, it may be a uh, uh, for, for a whole host of reasons, uh, uh, maybe better, more appropriate to, to vaccinate or use them in, in the certain uh, at-risk groups as opposed to uh, uh, other at-risk groups. Thank you. If I could add, uh, even uh, just to complete the answer, uh, the work that we're doing now with provinces and territories in terms of planning for phase two for the, for the, for the ramp up in the spring, uh, mostly with provinces, of course, and federal populations, uh, it is about uh, more Pfizer, more Moderna, but also those potential uh, vaccines as they come online, and what that means. Uh, um, and and those that those vaccines that are two to eight degrees, so that use normal uh, that uh, or cold chain requirements that are more that are closer to what the provinces are used to. Uh, the provinces are aligning themselves on that. They have plans to uh, leverage their. Um, uh, pharmacies and and their own uh, distribution systems, uh, uh, the way that they use them for influenza vaccines. So there's a lot of planning happening in the background. Now we're sending nasty advice on as to who should get which vaccine. Uh, we're planning on bringing those vaccines in Canada uh, and distributing them uh, across the country. 
Thank you. Uh, merci, opérateur. Next question. Our next question is from Ryan Samuti from the National Post. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Yeah, hi there. Um, I'm wondering, as we move into this, this second phase, into this ramp up, um, how equipped are we for storage when it comes to vaccines in case provinces start to experience uh, a backlog and being able to administer them for, for whatever reason. Maybe people aren't showing up for their appointments or, or issues like that. I, I'm wondering how much capacity we have for storage and at, at what point does our capacity for storage impact our, our deliveries? What point would companies stop delivering to us if we have too many in storage? Yes, so uh, it's General Forte here. I think uh, there's a couple of uh, different uh, aspects to your question. First, we have storage capacity in country right now, but they may not be at the right location for those types of vaccines that require uh, minus 80 or minus 20 freezers. The more freezers uh, are being procured, uh, it, the order uh, orders have been placed some time ago, uh, and they will be delivered, uh, you know, uh, in the next weeks. They will be brought to us as rapidly as they can be produced. Uh, so we'll be pushing them as planned to provinces and territories, and we'll continue to adjust those plans with the provinces as they uh, as they see those numbers, uh, those vaccines uh, uh, in their projections. Uh, and they will they will uh, prior reprioritize the location of those freezers, and we'll uh, ensure that that's well coordinated. In addition, there are other cold chain enabling equipment such as. Uh, uh, the, the credo cubes and, and dry ice and all of that that completes the cold chain uh, requirements. Um, the other aspect of your question is about throughput. And um, that, uh, in addition to the cold chain uh, enabling uh, the freezers and, and the, uh, the different types that are being procured, the provinces and territories are looking at ways to increase their um, uh, capacity to immunize with uh, the health workforce. And they are looking at non-traditional immunizers. Uh, they're looking at onboarding the pharmacies and, and various other uh, capabilities to ensure that we have the right, um, the most optimal system in place to deliver vaccines as rapidly as safely as possible. Thanks, follow up. Yeah, and so just, I, I'm wondering if there's anything in our contracts uh, with the with the vaccine companies about them suspending shipments if, if we are not using the vaccine. Uh, uh, sorry, thank you for the question. Uh, there, you know, discussions with uh, vaccine suppliers are ongoing. We, of course, work very closely. And, you know, we work with them to be able to demonstrate that Canada has the public health uh, backbone for the distribution and the health professionals available to administer it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. Our next question is from Paul Vieira from the Wall Street Journal. Please go ahead. I will have parole. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, Moderna is seeking to put addition to put some additional vaccine in each vial, uh, which would require a retooling at its plant that of up that could take up to ten weeks. Has Moderna discussed with Canadian officials possible delays in shipments to this retooling as um, in an attempt to uh, put more vaccine in each vial? Dr. New, I, I can speak. Yes, I have. I have no personal knowledge of that. That, that uh, obviously is a, is a bit of a, I would say, a logistical uh, uh, issue, uh, and uh, I can't speak for the regulators. So uh, uh, at this point, uh, I, I really have nothing to to uh, add uh, from a public health perspective. Thank you. No, what I'm what I'm asking is whether or not Moderna has advised of possible delay in shipments as it retools plants to put more. To possibly put more vaccine in each 
file. Uh, thanks for the question. This is Ariane Reza from Public uh, Services and Procurement Canada. Uh, while we discuss with Moderna and Pfizer and all the suppliers almost on a daily basis, the overview of their production and meeting their delivery uh, quotas, this particular issue has not been raised by Moderna. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Any other questions, Paul? No, go ahead. Okay, okay. So, operator, uh, we, we may have time for uh, one more set of questions. Jenny, thank you. Our next question is from uh, Tanda McCharles from the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. À vous la parole. Uh, yes, hi, Dr. New. Can I move back to um, your comments around, you know, you think it's interesting that um, there is data to show that, you know, the effectiveness of the vaccines after one dose is possible and that offsetting the ability to vaccinate more widely in vulnerable populations. Is that something that you're saying Health Canada is actively considering for Pfizer and or Moderna? Well, I can't say, I can't speak for Health Canada. I'm with the Public Health Agency of Canada. So uh, from a public health perspective, we've been having uh, active discussions with our our counterparts in the provinces and territories with the special advisory committee. Uh, I think, you know, it still stands with the official product monograph. Uh, ideally, I think the maximum protection based on their clinical trial data is for an uh, individual to receive a, a two dose regimen, you know, with a certain interval. Um, as we've mentioned previously uh, multiple times, uh, right now we're in a period of what we call relative vaccine scarcity. And so with a, a sort of a, a scarce vaccine supply, uh, the issue comes in terms of how uh, might the interval uh, be adjusted. And we've, we've spoken to that before. Uh, certainly, uh, where we're getting closer to, uh, to to the spring to April when we uh, anticipate getting uh, many more millions of doses of vaccine. However, in the meantime, based on early uh, data from the provinces and territories, uh, uh, what's happened in terms of vaccine effectiveness uh, uh, on, on, uh, among individuals receiving even one dose, uh, the level of protection is very high. And so that the question is, in terms of from a public health perspective, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at the interval, of course, uh, we would like to vaccinate everyone with two doses. But in the meantime, uh, what uh, what uh, should we do? Uh, should we consider, uh, you know, maybe vaccinating more people uh, as we have these uh, uh, doses come into Canada with the one dose and protect a larger number of people? And of course, uh, eventually uh, do the second dose uh, uh, for those people, but in the meantime, maybe uh, not uh, strictly following and, and saying it has to be a uh, two doses for uh, a smaller group of people as opposed to uh, a larger number of people receiving one dose. So that type of discussion, I think uh, we, we've mentioned uh, uh, was there even uh, several weeks ago, but certainly now as the data is coming forward and we're getting uh, uh, good uh, good uh, results uh, based on what some of the provinces and territories are telling us, uh, it's something to, to keep looking at. Thank you. And, and how would you describe, you, you say these are live discussions at the Special Advisory Committee, and so with, I, I assume that's with all the, the chief medical officers of health or public health officers across the country. How would you describe that discussion? Is there, um, uh, I guess, is there a sense that there's a real a desire on their part to, move, to do just that, to, to vaccinate more widely and, uh, you know, eventually deliver second doses, but, you know, get it out the door while you can? Well, I, I can't really speak for for individual uh, chief medical officers of health. I think you'd have to go to them individually. I'm sorry. Well, I'm the not thing is, it, it, it's it's a group discussion. I'm just just... The tenor, the tenor Hold on. Discussion, sir. Tanda, can you make sure what your okay. question is? Go ahead. Yep. Yep. I do yeah, say, I'm yeah, not, yeah. I think. Uh, the general tenor. Thank you. The general tenor. Well, I think uh, it's it's. Uh, I think uh, the chief medical officers of health. Uh, uh, I think are, are very interested looking at all of the science. And as I said, that the, the data is just coming in. So, you know, uh, with preliminary data coming in uh, with some encouraging results, uh, I think it's a good discussion. Uh, I would say also that there's so many, uh, many other factors in play, as we just mentioned earlier, you know, other things that uh, the chief medical officers of health are also looking at in terms of an overall vaccination uh, strategy uh, in their own jurisdictions is that, you know, if other vaccines uh, become licensed, like AstraZeneca, what would be the appropriate uh, use in place in, in terms of the planning for a vaccine rollout? So there are lots of other factors beyond just uh, 
the sort of the, the two vaccines that are currently approved and, uh, you know, what we could or should be doing uh, in the next several weeks. As, as I said, uh, you know, um, uh, we're anticipating many more millions of doses coming, I think, uh, uh, in the second quarter, which is not that far off, you know, it's still a few weeks away, but uh, uh, those are the kinds of things that uh, we're looking at. So in the meantime, I, I would defer to the individual uh, chief medical officers of health and as well as, uh, uh, you know, others uh, uh, in, in their own jurisdictions and making uh, sure that uh, looking at the data, what makes sense for them, uh, what their final uh, sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, plan might be in terms of uh, what they do now for, for the vaccine rollout based on uh, the evidence that they have. Everyone can look at the evidence uh, and uh, obviously based on, on uh, local and uh, sort of provincial context uh, and make their own uh, respective decisions. All right, thank you. thank you. Merci. This is the end of the technical briefing. Merci, bonne journée. Merci. Bye-bye.